webinar series on behalf of the Central Bank Research Association. Dominic Smith is my co-organizer. And without much ado, let me pass on the virtual stage to Rob Ridge from the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland, who will be today's moderator. Rob? Thank you, Raphael. Good morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on where you are. Thank you for joining the webinar. The topics of today's sessions are inflation and wage expectations of firms and employees and the expectations of others. I want to express my special thanks to the organizers, Rafael Shunle from Brandeis University in Sebra and Dominic Smith from the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics. As some background information for today's webinar, the webinar is 45 minutes in total with two presentations of approximately 15 minutes each and then 10 to 15 minutes for a Q&A session at the end. Uh, attendees do not have the option to switch on their audio video, but are invited to write comments or questions in the Q&A space. Attendees can, of course, post their questions during a presentation, so you do not need to wait until the end. So please, as the presentations are going on, and if you have questions, please go ahead and submit them. I will then select questions to be answered in the Q&A portion of the webinar after the presentations. The webinar is also live streamed via the Sebra YouTube channel, is, and is also recorded and made available on the Sebra website and Sebra YouTube channel after the event. Um, as a disclaimer, participation in a Sebra webinar does not constitute or imply an endorsement, recommendation, or favoring endorsement of the views, opinions, products, or services of the Central Bank Research Association or any other participating institution, individual, or entity. All views expressed during a Sebra or Sebra co-hosted event are strictly those of the authors discussants and other participants and not those of CEPRA, the co-sponsoring institutions or any other participating institution. So with all of that as background, I would like to introduce today's speakers. Our first speaker will be Sebastian Link, a postdoctoral researcher at the IFO Institute in Munich, who will be discussing inflation and wage expectations of firms and employees. Our second speaker will be Ina Hajini, research economist at the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland, and she'll be presenting the expectations of others. So with that, I will stop screen sharing and Sebastian, the floor is yours. Yeah, so uh, thank you, Rob, for this kind of introduction. And of course, uh, thanks to the organizers for putting us in the program. Um, this is not in full screen yet, but it will be in a second. So now, okay, great. Um, I'm going to talk about um, inflation and wage expectations of firms and employees, um, which is joint work with Lukas Buchheim from Dortmund and Sascha Möhle, uh, who's uh, also at IFO in Munich. And as the title says, we are interested in inflation expectations and how they relate uh, to wages. Or put it differently, we ask how large is the pass-through of expected inflation to wage growth, which is obviously a key mechanism in a potential wage price spiral. And despite of this uh, key role, we still know relatively little about um, the effect inflation expectations uh, have on wage setting, um, because you only have quite a few um, empirical estimates thus far, um, which usually point uh, towards uh, pass through being relatively low. And we know even less about the potential mechanisms behind these estimates. And we want to dig into this uh, by measuring and understanding pass-through using novel panel survey data among German firms and employees in order to first provide a quantitative benchmark of, uh, for the size of pass-through of inflation expectations. Um, and what you're going to uh, find and what you're going to see is that the pass-through that we find uh, is very small. Uh, it's small among firms and it's even smaller um, among employees. So depending on the empirical specification, pass-through of firms is going to be between 10 and uh, 25%, which means that a one percentage point higher inflation expectations expectation for the next year is reflected in a at a maximum a quarter of a percentage point higher wage growth expectation over that period. And with this, we are uh, very much in line with uh, other papers, including a paper by Ina, who is going to be next on the on US consumers. There's a paper on Canadian consumers. Um, there's uh, there, are, there are papers on Swiss and French firms, all uh, coming from different angles using different methods, uh, but all finding um, very small degrees of pass-through. 
And what we add to this is first that we kind of look into both firms and employees in the same kind of setting. Uh, and we can uh, have a, we have a panel dimension, which means that we can look into different potential mechanisms behind these estimates. And I'm going to dig into the role of weight rigidities, which uh, appear to play a role for explaining um, low pass through, and we can look into the role of wage bargaining in this setting. All right, let me skip the contribution in the interest of time and directly introduce you uh, to the data set. So we run our uh, surveys in parallel among roughly 3,000 firms and 1,500 employees in Germany. For firms, we um, amend the longstanding E4 business survey that some of you might know. And for employees, we run our own online survey. The frequency is quarterly, meaning that we um, can recontact our participants every three months, which then allows us uh, to, first of all, follow them over time, apply for, um, firm or individual level fixed effects, but also uh, assess the role of the prevailing current realized inflation rate at the point in time they fill the survey. We started doing so in December 20. 21, which was the period in time when uh, inflation was uh, starting to skyrocket in Germany, um, it's still ongoing. Um, so we now have eight waves of data, um, but what I'm going to show you today is based on the six survey waves until March of this year. As you all know, um, we had strong fluctuations in inflation during that period, uh, peaking at a rate of close to 10% in autumn of last year in Germany. All right, so the main um, variables we use are first the expected CPI inflation rate over the next 12 months, as well as the expected own wage growth over the next 12 months. So for firms, um, we tailor the question um, towards uh, the typical employee. So we do not want to have kind of uh, high management, upper management. Uh, we aim at a typical employee in the firm. And for employees, we ask them for wages on their, of their current job, holding everything else fixed. We also elicit information on how wages are set and other potential wage determinants that might be important uh, in um, explaining expected wage growth. We then simply try to uh, relate expected wage growth to expected inflation by um, regressing one on the other. So we regress expected wage growth on expected inflation, controlling for um, what we call expected fundamentals. So um, macro con um, expectations, uh, the expect uh, unemployment rate, um, the current con business conditions of the firm, expected business conditions of the firms, uh, both the firm itself or the, the firms the employees work at. Um, yeah, and then we, we look at different kind of we look at the data from different perspectives by adding uh, different kinds of fixed effects, which we can do because we have panel data. So in the first column, we do not apply any fixed effects. Then we add firm fixed effects or, in the, uh, or employees fixed effects, then time fixed effects, and in the very last one, both of them. Obviously, um, the identifying va variation strongly differs here. And uh, the interpretation of these coefficients is, is uh, depending on the specification. But what, you, what I want you to take away from this is that irrespective of the identifying var variation we look at, we get a ballpark of estimates of a pass-through um, that is all pointing towards slightly positive but very low average pass-through, which is a large among employees, uh, firms <laughs> than among employees, I'm sorry. Okay. As I said, this is more or less in line uh, with what other papers, including Ina's paper on uh, US consumers uh, have found. Um, and we now want to look a bit deeper into potential mechanisms. First one um, that you might directly think about is, okay, well, wages are rigid. They might not directly respond to increases in inflation or uh, just movements in inflation expectations. Um, in order to uh, set ideas here, what we should, um, in order to think about what we should expect uh, from uh, weight rigidities in terms of uh, their influence on, uh, the, on the past growth inflation expectations, we just draw from, uh, from Werning's brilliant paper of last year um, that um, yeah, looked at the role of wage 
rigidities for um, pass through. So what he does is he just takes a partial equilibrium perspective uh, where the log nominal wage um, just um, follows um, inflation. Once you now introduce wage rigidities in such a framework, he nicely shows that wage rigidities imply that the average pass-through is usually smaller than one in most of specifications of uh, wage rigidities. So what I plot here is uh, the case of Taylor pricing, uh, where uh, you are just have a staggered fashion, um, you adjust wages at period tau, two tau, three tau, et cetera. And what you directly see is, okay, you know that you, uh, once you are in, in point, uh, point tau, you know that you are going to reset wages at uh, period two tau. So you set the wage anywhere in between the current uh, price level and the, the wage that you uh, would freely set, so the flex price wage, um, the target wage that would prevail towards the end of the wage spell, which is then anywhere in between. And as uh, Werning shows, yeah, under reasonable calibrations, then the password should be roughly one half. He also shows that, that uh, under state dependent pricing, password is also smaller than one, which is both perfectly in line with our estimates uh, that are small, much smaller than one. Maybe we are even a bit smaller than his predictions. Um, so this is the first thing that points into the direction of uh, the importance of wage duties. The second thing that, that directly pops up here is um, the role of backward looking pass through. So uh, imagine you are now at uh, period two tau, the, your current wage is this, and then you have to kind of first make up for the gap that is uh, between your current wage and the currently prevailing uh, target wage, so to speak which depends on uh, past inflation, uh, the inflation happening in the period before. This means that um, nominal wages should catch up with realized inflation, which we can directly test or look at in the data by just throwing in the current realized inflation rate, um, which then gives us that uh, expected wage growth, future wage growth is associated with past inflation as just predicted uh, by wage opportunities. Second thing that you can uh, see from here is that for firms, forward-looking and backward-looking pass-through is now roughly comparable size once we run this horse race. But for employees, uh, the expected wage growth uh, is only related to past inflation only. The coefficient of forward-looking pass-through just goes to zero. This also holds once we uh, use uh, the current perceived inflation rate that we also elicit among employees. Okay, so pass through is also, there's also backward looking component of pass through. Sec uh, third thing uh, that directly comes uh, from wage rigidities that we should expect once wage rigidities are important in explaining pass through is yeah, that the average pass through is a combination of extensive and intensive margin, meaning that it's important whether you are about to adjust or not. And that pass through should be large if age, agents expect to reset wages during the one year ahead uh, forecast horizon. And we can also investigate this. Uh, we do this in several ways in the paper. I'm just going to present you one of those. Um, and it's, it's the one that um, exploits the variation in expiring dates of collective bargaining agreements. So a share of roughly a third of the firms in our sample is covered by a collective bargaining agreement. And these collective bargaining agreements um, have a usual duration of two years. And it's then kind of, it, it, it's changing over time and across industries of whether you are, are about to readjust the wage during the next year or not, just depending on the length of the coverage of the CBA. And the idea is that, okay, if the CBA is um, expiring during the next 12 months, you are about to, you know that you are go uh, going to readjust wages. And if it's not, you, you're not about to adjust. And our prediction would be uh, that those who are not about to adjust there, uh, you should see a lower pass through of inflation expectations because it simply cannot adjust the wage. In order to look at this, we merge um, industry level data on the expiring dates of collective bargaining agreements. 
uh, in order to construct a measure of the percentage of employees um, that are covered by a valid CBA 12 months ahead. Okay, so this is now the regression again that I showed you before, um, just for the subset of firms covered by a collective bargaining agreement. And among those, the average pass-through, a uh, forward-looking pass-through is uh, 11%. Uh, and uh, the backward-looking component is a uh, quarter, um, which is then different once you look at those separately that uh, are in industries where um, collective bargaining agreements are to be expired. So let me again explain you what this thing here is. So the share of valid collective bargaining agreements one year ahead is di if this is one, um, yeah, wages are fixed for all the employees in the given industry uh, one year ahead, still one year ahead. You know that today that it's still there, you cannot adjust. If it's zero, you, you know that you're about to adjust. So for those with a sh share of zero, pass through is larger. However, for those who are not about to readjust wages during the one year ahead forecast horizon, um, the sum of the two coefficients turns to zero. Forward-looking pass-through doesn't matter for them. Same thing for the current realized inflation rate. Yeah, it's it's just strongly it's, it's very important and strongly reflected in uh, wage growth expectations of those who are about to readjust, where the share of valid agreements one year ahead is zero. However, for those who are still under the same collective bargaining agreements one year ahead from now, um, the sum of the two coefficients uh, turns to zero. So timing really appears to matter. And if you if you are uh, covered by a collective bargaining agreement that's just running more than one year ahead, you, there's no room for those firms to um, yeah, uh, incorporate wage, uh, inflation expectations and the realized inflation rate to their wage growth expectations. Okay, let me spend my maybe last minus one minute on uh, a second perspective on these things. So a second perspective uh, you can take is looking at the role of bargaining for pass-through. Um, the idea here is that if you had high inflation expectations, you might search for a new job um, in order to generate an offer uh, that might give you a counter offer um, giving you, in, turning out in, in a higher wage. Or you might just bargain more often about your age. You might ask for a pay rise. And this is something we do not find in our data. We find only at most small associations between inflation expectations and on the job search and bargaining intensity, which then gives you uh, another potential reason why pass through of inflation expectations on wage growth is so low. Um, because people just do not search more intensively, do not uh, initiate wage bargaining more often. Last thing I want to stress here is um, that we also look into different uh, in, in, into uh, different degrees of bargaining power along different lines. So, for example, if employees who search for the job, for those we find that pass through is higher among this group, and it's much lower for those who do not search on a job. Um, we find that positive pass-through only for employees with some say in the wage setting, so to speak. Um, or in turn, if you are covered by minimum wage, for example, um, pass-through is zero. Um, and 15% of the German workforce earn the minimum wage. So this, again, gives you an indication why on average pass-through uh, is low. And lastly, um, Pass-through is higher for those firms who report a shortage of skilled labor, uh, or put it differently, um, in, in firms where they do not report shortage of skilled labor, where the bargaining power of employees is arguably lower, uh, pass-through is also lower. All right, let me wrap up here. This was a tour de force for a study uh, on the pass-through of inflation expectations on wage setting among panels of German firms and employees. Um, we find that average pass-through is low for firms and it's even lower for employees in our setting. Um, we find that this is uh, strongly in line with the uh, presence of wage utilities because first we find evidence for backward-looking pass-through. 
So the um, realized inflation matters for wage expectations, particularly for employees. Um, and uh, yeah, pass through is high at the intensive margin. So it re timing really matters whether you are, are about to adjust the wage or not. Lastly, pass through via bargaining. Um, we only find limited um, evidence on that wage bargaining spurs at high inflation expectations spur more wage bargaining. Uh, and we find that um, employees having more bargaining power also uh, exhibit a higher pass through of their inflation expectations to their wage expectations. Thanks a lot for listening. Thanks very much, Sebastian. Um, as a reminder for our audience, if you have questions, please go ahead and submit them into the Q&A and then we will be able to get to them um, after Ina's presentation. So with that, I'd like to um, turn it over to Ina, um, who will be discussing the expectations of others. Um, Ina, the floor is yours. Thank you, Rob. Um, first, many thanks to the organizers for extending the invite to talk about this paper. This is joint work with Ezekiel Garcia Lambertman, John Lear, Matthew Peramonte, and, and Raphael Schonle. And since Matthew and I are colleagues at the Cleveland Fed, the usual disclaimer that these are our own views of bias. Okay, so recently there has been a boom in survey data that has enabled a number of us to study how inflation expectations are being formed among many other very interesting questions. And as far the evidence is pointing uh, towards a finding that heuristics and more importantly, personal experiences, they're crucial when it comes to how people form beliefs about inflation and how they project those beliefs into the future. However, we do live in a very well interconnected world where we learn quite a bit by socially interacting with one another. And here think about people sharing experiences with friends and families regarding different prices such as rents, uh, grocery prices, gas prices, and so on and forth. Or think about how many times um, you'll scroll through Twitter, Facebook, or whichever is your favorite social media platform and learn something new. In fact, the idea that social interaction can affect our beliefs and therefore, by extension, expectations is not new. Many decades ago, Festinger proposed a theory of social comparison, hypothesizing that people evaluate their opinions and abilities by comparison, respectively, with the opinions and abilities of others. And yet, the role of social networks for inflation expectations remains largely unknown. And that's not because this is, um, this is not an interesting question, but it is primarily because um, there has been a lack of a sufficiently appropriate data infrastructure that would, would enable us to, to study this type of question. And here, what I mean by appropriate um, is a large and rich um, data set on individual inflation expectations. And this is exactly what our paper is gonna try and do. We will try to investigate the importance and relevance of social networks for inflation expectations, both theoretically and empirically. The paper makes two contributions to the current stance of the literature. First, we're going to introduce social interaction as an explicit and novel ingredient into the memory and recall uh, framework of expectations formation in Bordalo and, and co-authors. And from there, we're going to derive a number of testable implications um, um, uh, based on, on, a, on a newly constructed uh, data set that is the result of the merger of two large data sets. Uh, and in particular, what we're going to do with this newly constructed data set is we're going to try to establish the importance of social networks for inflation expectations. The two data sets that I'm referring to is first the indirect consumer inflation expectations, now known by the acronym of ICIE, where we'll make use of over uh, 1.9 million observations uh, together with individual inflation expectations will be able to observe the location of respondents at the zip code level together with their detailed demographic characteristics. And we're going to merge the data set with the social connectedness index a data set that describes the Facebook connection linkages at the county level. What do we find? Um, so empirically, we're going to find that social networks are indeed a relevant channel for how people form inflation expectations through the lens of the theoretical model. That means that people are attentive to experiences shared via the social network. Our second important result is that common gender networks, they amplify inflation expectations at times of high inflation. Seen from the point of view of the model, that means that these uh, discriminated networks um, 
for gender, they increase similarity um, between the shared experiences in the network and a scenario of high inflation. And finally, and, and very importantly, we're going to find that generally there is no evidence of local shocks being destabilizers for inflation expectations via networks, with the important remark there that salient local shocks can get inflation expectations closer to the uh, threshold of instability, but we're never surpassing that. And this, from the point of view of the model, means that the total attention that we pay as a society to our personal experiences exceeds our attention, um, uh, again, aggregated attention uh, that we pay to experiences that are being shared um, on social networks. So um, in the interest of time, I'll, I'll very briefly uh, mention what we, what we do theoretically. We start off with the benchmark model without social interaction, very closely following uh, two papers of, of Bordalo and, and, their co and his co-authors. And how does, it, how does this, this work? Well, suppose that you're interested in forming some probability assessment around some hypothetical scenario that I'll call uh, this, hypo uh, this hypothetical scenario K. And in order to do so, what you're going to do is start uh, recalling uh, experiences from uh, your memory database. And then the probability that you recall this hypothetical scenario K is going to depend on the similarity between each one of the experiences in your, mem in your memory database and this scenario K. And from there, the expectations are going to be formed by relying on subjective probabilities that in and of themselves are stemming from the recall process. Now, what does social interaction do? Well, the social interaction is going to affect the recall probabilities and by extension expectations by extending the set of experiences that you can, you can draw from. Well, how can then you know, social networks become an amplifier for expectations? Um, the general mechanism works as follows. Whenever experiences that are being recalled uh, from the social network add more relevance than irrelevance with respect to this, this uh, uh, hypothetical scenario of interest K, they can amplify the recall probability and therefore expectations, right? So for instance, if I were to think of the hypothetical scenario to be scenario of, of high inflation, then if you recall uh, experiences from the social network that are adding more relevance than, than irrelevance, right? More experiences that, that speak, um, you know, more to, to, to a scenario of high inflation, uh, then, they're going to, uh, the social network is going to amplify the recall probability of the high inflation scenario, and therefore it's going to amplify your inflation expectations. We have a number of, of implications and, and theoretical results in the paper that in the, in the interest of time, I'll, I'll skip for today and jump uh, immediately to the, uh, to the data sets that we're, that we're using. So one of them is the social connectedness index. Uh, this index has been constructed by Bailey and, and co-authors. And this, this index is constructed as in, as in equation number one. So essentially we're taking the Facebook connections between any two counties, C and K, and, and dividing those connections by the product of the Facebook users in each one of these two counties. And from there, we're going to define bilateral social connectedness weights between any two counties as described in equation number two. And you need to think of these, of these weights as a sort of measuring the relative importance of, of a particular county with respect um, um, in, in the in the social in the social um, context, and by construction, these weights, right? They do not really need to be uh, symmetric. In fact, they they are generally asymmetric. The second data set that we're going to make use of is um, is the one on indirect consumer inflation expectations. This is a novel uh, way of eliciting consumers' inflation expectations that relies on the indirect utility theory. And the question goes as follows. Given your expectations about developments in prices of goods and services over the next year, how do your income have to change so that you're equally well off to the present so that you can buy the same amount of goods and services as you do today? Um, to make me equally well off, then my income would have to increase, stay about the same or decrease. We have been conducting this, this survey uh, since um, um, February of, of 2021. It's still ongoing. We're receiving about 20,000 responses on a weekly basis. Um, as I mentioned earlier, together with individual level inflation expectations, we're also observing the location of our respondents at the zip code level, as well as their demographic factors. In the present paper, we're going to rely on the monthly variation since the birth of the, of the 
of the survey up until uh, summer of the of the current year. And then combining this ICI measure together with the newly constructed weights, we're going to come to, to, to uh, construct the expectations of others at the county level. So the expectations of others, they're constructed by taking the weighted average of the expectations of any other county as in equation number three. Now, when we get to the to the empirics, right? There's a number of challenges that we need to address. So we're going to deploy a three-step approach. First, we're going to ask whether the network matters. And we prove in the paper that conditional on the network being appropriately identified, a no less estimate different from zero will mean that the network matters, right? We can discuss of, of you know, whether the magnitudes have been well identified, but that, that would be sufficient for us to, uh, to say that the network indeed matters. The next important question is eventually, well, well are, are social networks appropriately identified? Are they maybe reflecting other linkages? Uh, so for instance, think um, of counties within the same state. Eventually, they're very well interconnected with one another, socially speaking, but they are also very well interconnected, economically speaking, policy-wise, and so on and forth. So to address that, we're going to follow two, we're going, we're going to follow two approaches. First, we're going to remove the close by counties from the network to discard the effects of local shocks. And the second appro approach is to enrich the data structure by adding an additional layer to the network. And we're going to do that by discriminating along demographic features so that we're able to control by county time fixed effects that will absorb all of these other uh, linkages. And finally, how do we get to the unbiased estimate? Uh, we're going to do that by constructing an exogenous expectation shock to the network so that we can get to the causal impact of, uh, of social interactions on expectations. And today I'll, I'll show you some results um, regarding the first and the third question in the interest of time. So social interaction, we do find it matters for inflation expectations. How do we show that? Well, we're going to start off with, with an OLS uh, estimation. We're going to run individual inflation expectations on the expectations of everybody else within the same county and the expectations of, of others while controlling by county at the, and time fixed effects. And eventually here, the, the important, um, the important um, um, uh, coefficient is this beta two. And we prove in the paper that given that the social networks are appropriately identified, all that we need to show that social networks matter for inflation expectations is that this beta two estimate is different from zero. And as you can see in the table right here, the expectations that the beta two um, coefficient is everywhere positive and um, very significantly so, right across different across different specifications. Um, let me then get to the to the uh, construction of this exogenous um, expectations shock in the in the network. So, what do what do we know thus far? Well, we know that consumers they tend to lose to use local prices to form expectations. However, we cannot use variation in expectations coming from variation in local prices because prices in themselves are affected by local demand and therefore they're also affected by, by expectations. So what we're going to do is use a strategy that we've been using in a different paper. We're going to exploit cross-sectional um, uh, here, cross-sectional meaning cross-county variation on the usage of gas by relying on the average use of cars to commute. Okay, so in particular, what we're going to do is regress individual inflation expectations on this inter interaction between gas prices at the national level and the average usage of, of, car, of cars at the county level. Um, an important thing to mention here is that, of course, we're controlling by county and time fixed effect, but also that the usage of national gas prices instead of local gas prices is intentional so that we can avoid any local influence and the time fixed effects will eventually absorb all of the aggregate effects. We're going to go one step further and following the evidence in Dacundo and, and, and co-authors, we're going to you know, not take for granted that this psi is the same across across genders. Um, in fact, Dakunda and, and others, they show that gender differences in inflation expectations, they're uh, coming due to distinct attention paid to, to certain prices, right? So we're going to discriminate that, that psi, this psi, we're going to estimate it differently for men and women. And from there, we're going to construct a new variable that we're going to call gas effect. That is nothing more but... Um, 
but um, uh, it, it's it's it, it's telling us the exogenous variation in inflation expectations that is coming because of the, the variation in the exposure to uh, changes in, in gas prices. And indeed, as we postulated earlier, this PSI right, is much higher for men than it is for women, um, totally in line with, with what is found in, in, in uh, the evidence presented in Dakunda and, and others. From there, what we're going to do is run an IV regression at the individual level. We're going to regress individual individual inflation expectations on the expectations of everybody else and the expectations of others, where the latter is being instrumented by the gas effect using the same uh, weights that, that we use in the construction of the expectations of others. And indeed, what we're going to find, right, in column number two, is that uh, the expectations of others, right, uh, the, the estimate of beta two is 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 really high. It's about 0.5, uh, significantly different from from zero. And from here, um, I'm not going to have time to talk about it today, but we do show in the paper that given this estimate, uh, we do not find um, an evidence that local shocks would be uh, destabilizers for inflation uh, expectations via, via the network, which is somewhat uh, comforting. So to conclude, um, what, we, what we do in this paper is study the relevance and importance of social networks for inflation expectations, both theoretically and empirically. We're finding that social networks are a relevant channel for how people form inflation expectations, meaning that people are attentive to experiences that are being shared via networks. Common gender networks, they amplify inflation expectations at times of high inflation, meaning that such networks increase the similarity between experiences that are being shared on the network and a hypothesis of high inflation. And finally, we find no evidence of local shops destabilizing inflation expectations via networks. However, Salient local shocks, such as gas prices, they yield an effect of inflation expectations um, of the expectations of others that is higher than the OLS estimate, implying that local shocks can get um, salient local shocks. They can get expectations closer to instability. And what that means is that the attention that we pay as a society to personal experiences exceeds the attention that we pay to experiences shared via the social networks. And I'm looking forward to the. Um, Q&A session. Thank you, Ina, very much. Uh, again, let me take this opportunity to reach out to the members in the audience, and if they have any questions, please go ahead and submit them in, in the Q&A. So I'm going to start off with a question from Rafael and Sebastian. This is for you. Uh, Rafael's question is, in the exchange rate pass-through literature, the distinction is made between short, medium, and long-run pass-through. You seem to find some differences between firms and employees in your main regression. Could dynamics over medium and longer horizons play a role? Have you tried including perhaps multiple lags of realized inflation rates? And can you ask about um, longer expectations horizons? Yeah, obviously, this is a great question. Rafael, thank you very much, uh, despite of the fact that you're now running. Uh, so have a nice run. Um, all right. Uh, yeah, it's a very rich question. So, and um, there, obviously, you're completely right. Uh, it's not only about short term, one year ahead stuff. So, people, uh, it just which is directly coming from the fact that I just showed you yeah, that uh, some wages are fixed over a period of two years, especially if they are under a collective bargaining agreement. And what we we did a few things on this, and we can certainly do do even more because we have um, the possibility to to run these these things over and over again. Um, so adding new waves. But what we have done, uh, we have elicited um, two years ahead wage growth expectations, um, and we can look into this, which we have not done yet. But we only have this for uh, one survey wave yet, so I don't know whether there's something uh, getting out of here. Uh, we also looked into different lags. Uh, it's not really, um, there are no, no much differences between employees and, and firms, if I um, remember correctly. But what we can also do uh, is we have uh, inflation expectations also elicited prior to the period in time once we started to um, ask for wage growth expectations. So we can also look at uh, kind of surprises in uh, inflation expectations. So expectation errors in there and which role they play for, um, for uh, wage growth. Um, 
what we have, and this is the single one, and this is only partially uh, correlated to your question, is we have um, medium run inflation expectations. And we have looked into the uh, connection between medium run inflation expectations and wage growth expectations. And then we almost find a zero effect. So um, the, the, the short run wage growth expectations do not appear to be related um, to medium run inflation expectations, especially after controlling for short run inflation expectations and this is perfectly in line with with Werning's finding who just said okay uh, if you know that you are ago about to readjust the wage in two years from now or in one year from now it's just you don't care about medium run inflation expectations and this is what we also uh, find in some waves of our of our survey Thank okay you. thanks Sebastian um, another question from Raphael but this one is for you Ina uh, can you speculate what the findings might imply for policymakers and for research on inflation expectations going forward? Um, sure. Yeah, that's um, um, two very good questions, I think. So I'll start from the from the letter. So we do like to think of this paper as um, sort of opening the gates for a new channel that might be affecting inflation expectations that, as I mentioned during the presentation, you know, I probably has not been studied because of a lack of a desire to, to go after it, but because of a lack of data infrastructure. So we do think that that um, um, studying how others are affecting uh, or, or the experiences of other people are affecting our own beliefs uh, matters. And this deserves, you know, a lot more, we believe a lot more attention, both theoretically, but there's, of course, other things that people can do empirically. With regards to the effect, the sort of implications for policymakers, I think that maybe the most important one is coming from the stability uh, point of view or the stability results, right? So the comforting thing is that we do not find local shocks being uh, destabilizers of inflation uh, expectations via networks, right? Which is which is very comforting. Otherwise, we would be in a situation where. Um, um, we would be maybe looking at many, maybe even sunspot type of type of equilibria where a local shock um, occurring, let's say in New York City, it would start, you know, uh, having spillover effects in terms of inflation expectations in in many other in many other cities, and it would be very easy to get expectations uh, de-anchored, which of course it's not great for for inflation and and certainly not great for for monetary policy. On the other hand, however, right, there's a word of caution there that. Um, um, you know, the saliency of, of these local shocks might, might also matter. So as I mentioned during the presentation, we do find that that, that this effect of, of the expectations of others on inflation expectations, uh, you know, comes, it's much higher when you look at, um, at um, when, you, when you're instrumenting for the expectations of others by relying on, on gas prices, which is, which is a salient, which is a salient uh, price. So therefore, it means that maybe we need to be also a little bit, um, you know, maybe a little bit more attentive to um, to a salient to salient prices because we know that people are actually paying paying attention to them and those can have spillover effects on the on the inflation expectations through network that are that are higher than uh, than than the average. Um, okay, great, thanks. We we have time for a couple more questions and I'm gonna substitute for Raphael and ask two of my own, but the first one will be for Sebastian. Um, can you, in the, in the work that we did, there was a significant amount of heterogeneity in terms of the pass through. So could you, if you could just briefly summarize it, you may have touched on it, but I think it's really important to note the, the degree of heterogeneity in, in sort of pass through and briefly touch on that or, or share your findings. Oh, Sebastian, I think you're yeah. on mute. Yeah, so. sorry. <laughs> yeah, there's there's plenty of heterogeneity, and we can look into many many different things here. Um, so, as I said, the, the the most important thing that we look at is heterogeneity in anything that is related to kind of bargaining power of um, of employees. Um, so um, maybe I just stress these things again. So. Um, Along many different lines that we can that that we look at the data, um, those employees that seem to have some um, bargaining power, for those we find more uh, positive, um, um, a stronger pass through of inflation expectations on wage growth expectations. So, um, which means that they, for the for the very very large bunch of employees that yeah just get posted wages or 
who um, yeah, suffer from a bad bargaining position, uh, we we just see that uh, password is very, very low. They can do, they think they can do very little and they will suffer strongly or, yeah, exactly. This is so may, maybe the, the, the most important thing. Then you can, of course, look at the, the more elderly versus the younger ones, uh, et cetera. But the, the most important thing and it's, it's almost always boiling down to to uh, kind of the bargaining position of of the individual, uh, and uh, then this is strongly related to how strongly they perceive they can make up for uh, inflation again, in their wages. Thanks. So, Ian, I'm going to ask you a very quick question. I know we're short on time, and if there's not enough time, I apologize. One of the things I'm, I guess would ask is for something like inflation. Um, age and your, the social network that you're interacting with, the age of that might be important. So for example, people that lived through high inflation in the 70s, not that I'm suggesting that I might have done that, but let's just, you know, for the moment, I guess the question is, when you're asking about the social network, how are you able to control for, or how would you think about age? Because experience will be very much a factor of age and the particular events would also be impacted, I would think. So if you could just maybe come on, comment on that very quickly, I would, I would be interested to hear. Uh, sure. So I did not. I I mentioned that, you know that we're discriminating the network um, by gender, but in the paper we actually have all sorts of different forms of discriminating the network, and one of them is is by age, and we do find in fact that social networks of uh, common age groups they amplify inflation expectations a lot more than 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 what, than what we're finding on on average. Uh, so so it you know it does seem that. Um, I'm just going to speculate here, but it does seem that people that are sharing common demographic factors like age, gender, etc., right? They probably they share similar experiences with one another that gives rise to this amplification channel of, of inflation expectations through networks. Okay, but that's great. a great question. All right, thanks, Eva. So with that, I think we're 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 at the end of today's um, session. So I want to thank again both of our speakers, to both Sebastian and Ina, for a very interesting discussion. And then in closing, uh, let me remind everyone that the next webinar will be on November 30th and will feature Ming Hao Li from Peking University um, talking about the anatomy of countercyclical dispersion of price changes, as well as Michael Lamla from the University of Duisburg Essen, who will be presenting firms' expectations passed through into prices and wages. And the moderator will be Hugh Montag, for a research economist at the Bureau of Labor Statistics. So again, my thanks to everyone for participating. Sebastian, Ina, thank you. And to our organizers, to Raphael and Dominique. And we'll see you again in two weeks. Thank you very much.